my name is Garrett Fuller. I uh, work for Emma Martin G. Um, I also work for PACS. Uh, and I am very, very lucky to have worked with these people up here, um, some of them for a very, very, very long time. Uh, the history of games in uh, MMORPGs goes back a long way, and I think part of what built MMOs and made them to be the genre that we really all love and care about uh, is community. It's you guys. Uh, it's how you work within the games, how you work with the developers, and how we build better worlds together, uh, which is awesome and makes it fun. Uh, and with that, um, I want to introduce our panelists, and we're going to go over a lot of different ideas, a lot of different ways players try the games. And, uh, and also some of the great content that, that these folks have worked on. So, so I'm going to start on my left uh, with Amanda Bro. Hi there. Uh, Amanda's been uh, up here in Boston for a long time, right? Yeah, since uh, 2007. Yeah. So she works at uh, Standing Stone Games, uh, which uh, controls, she's very excited. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, they work on Lord of the Rings Online and Dungeons and Dragons Online, uh, which is fantastic. Two, two great games that have been around a long time and continue to build uh, into the future and work with their fans. Uh, next to me is uh, Aaron Prince. Hi. Yeah, I'm gonna make that. I'll get better at it. I'm sorry. Erin's uh, very lucky. She works for a company called Disruptor Beam, uh, and Disruptor Beam has some of the biggest mobile titles out there that we all really love. It's definitely some major IPs like Star Trek, uh, Game of Thrones, um, Walking Dead. Uh, and so it's it's great to see those games come to life on mobile. And you have you know massive Star Trek fan communities that you're. <laughs> um, Besides the space. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> to to my right is uh, is is you know one of my favorite game developers. Uh, he's been around a long time. He's made a lot of games. Um, <coughs> for <a quest>. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Brad McQuaid, who's working on Pantheon, uh, his new product that uh, you know successfully um, crowdfunded and has been building an MMORPG, uh, which I'm very excited about because we need more solid MMORPGs going into the future. Um, and then, and then on my far right uh, is again um, one of my favorite people in the game industry, Linda Carlson, and that has been a community manager everywhere. SOE. <laughs> well. It, SOE for a very long just, time. Just two companies. Right. Yeah. And uh, now she works at Triumph Worlds uh, that uh, makes uh, Rift, uh, Arcage, um, God, I can think of a lot of them. Okay. Trove. Trove. Atlas Reactor. Atlas and Reactor. And Defiance, which is about to relaunch as Defiance 2050. Yes. There Super you go. Cool. So, awesome. So, um, what I want to do is uh, I'll start by allowing these guys to talk a little bit about their products. We'll go back to my left and start with Amanda. Uh, and we'll go down the list real quick, and then we'll start to get into some ideas on how players shape games and, and how you guys as community really drive things. So, Amanda, why don't you, why don't you start? Sure. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Dungeons and Dragons Online or Lord of the Rings Online, uh, essentially, uh, MMOs MMO have been around since about 2006, 2007, and then later converted into free-to-play games where they were doing both subscriptions and microtransactions. Uh, we also focus a lot on story in these games. So if you're playing Lord of the Rings, you're obviously following the journey of Frodo and the Ring all the way up to Mordor and beyond. And then you're also getting all of the deep details of the story that you didn't get to see. And exploring further, we have lore masters that focus on the lore. Uh, for Dungeons and Dragons, we do a mixture of both uh, content based in the Eberron and Forgotten Realms settings, as well as taking older classic D&D modules, like, you know, Temple of Elemental Evil, and trying to recreate those in the 3D environment so you can go in and experience them in person. Awesome. Erin, go ahead. Uh, so at the Shucker Beam, I'm working primarily on Star Trek Timelines, also working on Game of Thrones Ascent, and we're really excited about um, how we're building up the Walking Dead March to War. Um, so, if you haven't played these, they all have different histories. Uh, Gota started off as a Facebook game that then moved to mobile until the community came with it. Uh, the amazing thing about that is the expectation now uh, that we meet in Gota that if you saw it in the episode, the next week you're going to see it in the game. So, that is a fun thing that we get to continue to work on. Boy, are we looking forward to the last season. Um, Star Trek Timelines, uh, 
is a little different. Uh, it started as mobile and has now expanded to things like Facebook and Steam. And so that community has uh, evolved with it. And that came up with no uh, shows or movies really propping up, but taking 50 years of classic Star Trek and putting it all together. And then we were incredibly fortunate to be given brand new Star Trek episodes. Uh, so we are now working very closely with CBS and bringing that brand new content in. But that means we have a whole new group of Star Trek fans who this is their first real experience with it. We're now coming in and playing Star Trek timelines and learning all about the world. So that's really exciting. Um, and then The Walking Dead uh, March to War is our first foray into that kind of uh, hyper-competitive 4X uh, genre so it's a whole new community that we're building up it's a whole new group of different walking dead fans and we're actually based on the comic book so we get to reach in and really uh talk with people who aren't just fans of the show but know the different virgin storylines and how we get to balance those is uh really exciting awesome right go ahead so i think probably the best way to describe camp on rise of the plot line is um you know, in the last five, eight years, massively multiplayer games have uh, kind of shifted more towards the casual side of things, which is fine. Um, but it's all, what happened then is, is a, there was a vacuum left behind uh, full of former MMO players who uh, they want challenge, they want to have to group, they want, they want to uh, explore, they love shared experiences, and that's how our you know, the team feels, that's how our community feels. And so we're kind of, we're, we're filling that vacuum that, that uh, exists now by, um, by creating a game that's uh, just focused on those things. So we're really excited about it. We're, uh, we started pre-alpha testing back in December. We have about 800 people uh, in the game helping, uh, helping us out. That's going really well. And uh, we'll be uh, should be an alpha towards the end of the year, beta next year, and we'll release it when it's ready. That's one of the kind of nice things about being a, an indie company is that you uh, don't have these crazy dates forced upon you. So um, I yeah. got you so much. <laughs> well, I've, I've been I've, I've gone through it long enough, so uh, we're doing it this way. So anyway, yeah, that's that's a challenge community conquest. That's been yeah. I'm so glad I get to go last because now I don't feel obliged to hurry. So you guys can have the microphone back in about 40 minutes or so. <laughs> uh, at at Trial Worlds, uh, we currently have five live games, and those game communities could not be more different from one another if they tried. Every single game has grown its own social structure, its own set of expectations, its own ways that it likes to communicate and, and to be communicated with. So, for instance, we're a publisher for ArcAge, which is developed in Korea. So there is that extra, there's that extra line that we have to cross all the time when we're taking player feedback to the de developers. And uh, that can be extremely challenging. With Rift, that game launched uh, seven years ago. It's still going strong. And that's a game that went from a, a very standard monthly subscription model to the free-to-play model. And now we just launched the Prime service, which gives people the opportunity to go back to the monthly subscription model because so many people wanted it, together with, as Brad mentioned, a more challenging environment. And so that, that's been a very interesting thing to see with feedback. We have Trove, which is so fast-paced, growing so rapidly and so frenetic that I get exhausted whether I'm in a meeting with the devs or playing the game. And that game is almost entirely built around player feedback. And it's, it's insane. And somehow it works, even though it's completely crazy. Uh, Atlas Reactor, it's a, an arena-based fighting game. And it's a relatively small, tight-knit community. And those players are in direct contact with the devs all the time. They, they live stream together, they play together, it's wonderful. And Defiance, that game's been around a long time. It was tied to uh, the sci-fi series Defiance, which ran for three years. And we're about to relaunch it with better graphics and a lot of changes that have been implemented simply because that's what our core player base wanted. And it's also what we wanted to present to people on the newer console platforms. So uh, I, I can tell you right now that Triad is a, a game that, because of our CEO, Scott Hartsman, who apologized that he couldn't make it here today due to his scheduling conflicts, 
But anytime we're not listening close enough to player feedback, he just jumps in a channel and says, so, here's this stuff. I want you guys to pay attention to it and make things happen. Um, uh, by the way, is, is Malakin in the audience? Reddit guy, Malakin? No? Okay, I'll try to catch up to him later, but uh, Hartsman wanted to send a special shout out to him. Okay, I'm done. Cool. Um, so one of the interesting things that, that Linda touched on, that we're going to go into a little bit, is how you guys as players can actually communicate with these guys as developers. And uh, I, th I think there's a lot of different mechanisms. Years ago, it was, you know, with, with community, it was kind of looking at the forums and sometimes the loudest voices tried to, you know, make changes that weren't correct for the game. Uh, I know we've all been through the horror stories of it, even <laughs> us at MMORPG. Was, Fascinating how people uh, get, but now there's a lot of different avenues for fans to interact with developers: the live streaming, talking on Reddit, talking on game forums, uh, going back and forth, even on like, Twitter, and uh, all these different social tools that connect everybody as a group. So, um, what we'll go back through really quickly and go back to Amanda and tell us: you know, Lord of the Rings and Dungeons and Dragons have been around for a long time, so you have incredibly core audiences that you work with. How do you? talk to your players and, uh, and go back and forth with that standing stuff. Sure. Uh, so we like to do a blend of active and passive feedback. So your active feedback are the more traditional methods of players can come to our official places, our forums or you know, our Facebook pages, um, our live streams, and directly reach out to us. Uh, our community manager sits right in the developers and pretty much any time there's something major happening, they'll literally turn around to one of us and say, hey, the community's talking about X. Um, so that's one methodology. We also read through when you don't realize that we're reading through, so there'll be discussions happening among the players that are you know, maybe one guild is just talking to another guild. Even though they don't mean for the conversation to come at us, we're still observing it because we want to see how you're talking with each other. Uh, my personal favorite is the infiltration method of feedback. We'll be in the game because we like to play too. Uh, we're in your world chat, we're in your guilds, we're in your parties, and we're going, hello fellow players, well yes, how about the dungeons and or dragons? Well yes. So uh, it's amazing the difference you'll get. Sometimes players can get a little either more aggressive or starstruck if they know that we're watching and they may say something that maybe there's a problem they're having but they're too shy to actually say, hey, I don't like this, because they're like, oh my god, I'm talking to the developer. So when you see them talking with each other, that's when you're going to get a little bit more of a genuine response from the users, where they're talking about things like, oh man, I really hate how I have to go from this thing to this thing. They might never bother to bring something like that up to us in person, but just watching them passively, you can see all of this different type of feedback. And then you sort of aggregate it all together, because you obviously don't want to just pick one path and say, this is the only one that we're listening to. You have to get a blend of everything. Basically, your community is anywhere that your players are, and especially anywhere where they can communicate with each other. Awesome. Aaron, you come from a different angle on uh, not only you managing you know, large communities with powerful IPs, you're in the mobile space. So, so what's some of the ways they can reach out to you? About? So we have tried to use some of the traditional methods of having official forums uh, that we use, and we have our Facebook page and Twitter that we're used to. We've had to get a little creative as well. One of the big things that we use uh, that you don't even realize is always feedback on the game, because sometimes uh, you, you, you have a problem and you send in a ticket, and it's like, oh, I need I didn't get this thing that I wanted, or I went through all of this work and it was a little bit too hard. We take that as feedback too. We actually aggregate that every week and use, maybe you weren't supposed to try to give feedback directly to a developer and you just want to say, hey, uh, my, my mail got stuck and I can't get it out. But we still take that as feedback of, it was important to you that you got this. What was in there that you really wanted to hear? Um, so we take those channels as well. Uh, we've also started having to get direct with people. So last night, Disruptor Beam had a player party where people who are big fans of our games came and we stand around for hours with a beer in one hand and listening to everybody's suggestions to get that kind of feedback as we can. And we add it to what do we know that's going on in the forums? What do we know that's going on in Facebook? What are all of the tickets saying? Um, and we've now just started going out and putting out service. It's like, here's the thing, which feature, 
Which features are you loving? Which ones are you hating? Tell us why. Um, because we've started up the small conversations and it's hard on mobile because you can't get back and forth. With, uh, we don't have a good back and forth inside the game yet for that. So we're like, all right, go to the Google form. Give us all of your rundown. And sometimes it leads to great things. Uh, we did one of these and now we took your favorite Star Trek uh, series, turned out it was DS9, and your favorite uh, pseudo villain factions, it was the Augments, and we're going to slam it together and create an entire month's worth of content around that new idea because the players told us that was their favorite through our survey system. Brad, you've seen a lot of different sides of this, where uh, back in the day when you guys were working on EverQuest and, and different titles, you know, the, the, the game came out and the community formed, right? Now it's with Pantheon, the community is forming along with the game. So what's that experience like for you? And obviously you work closely with the community to, to drive feedback and to build out the world. Um, what tools do you guys use? Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything possible. Um, yeah, that was one thing, you know, way back in the day, um, the, the communities kind of came together, but uh, having been doing this so long, we realized that uh, it's incredibly important to get that community coming together, especially that core community, um, as soon as possible. So um, that's, you know, one of the reasons why we, we did uh, and are doing a, a pre-alpha, you know, having people help, help us test the game, give us feedback, They've got their own special forums. We have our regular forums where we're constantly interacting with uh, with our future players, uh, Discord channel, Facebook, Twitter, everything, basically everything. Uh, you know, doing, doing streaming to bring, to build the community up. But really, um, the reason why what we learned is that uh, when making a massive multiplayer game, uh, it's just so big. And there's so many ideas um, that you want the community in there as quickly as, as, as can be because there are ideas that sound great on paper, but once you expose them to several hundred people, um, you learn you, you learn like it might not have been, you know, it needs to be tweaked, maybe it even needs to be ganged. So we focused on uh, making a fun foundation uh, in the game, and then as we get into alpha and beta, we're, that's when we're going to be putting uh, more of our, uh, our advanced differentiators, new features, hopefully that move the genre forward. But we're going to be doing it in a way where we're doing it hand in hand with the community. Um, so they can, again, let us know, hey, this is fun, or yeah, that sounded really cool, but this is not working out. You might want to tweak this and this. Um, and then, of course, we're also uh, having, you know, big portion of what's funding the game is crowdfunding and so we're deeply uh, indebted to the, the community for uh, supporting us so much, believing in us, having faith in us. So it's, you know, one of our, you know, hashtag uh, lines when, when we do tweets and things like that is community matters and it really does. Whenever I interact with the community, I remind them, it's like, you guys are part of this and you're as important as the dev team or anybody else because uh, the feedback and the encouragement that we get just energizes our team and keeps us marching forward. And if you want to tell Brad how you really feel about Pantheon, they're on the show floor, so you know, go, go, go down there and tell them face to face. And that's one of the important things in any game company these days is we're trying to eliminate the barriers between developers and players because, you know, we're, we're exactly the same as you guys. We just do a different job for them. Uh, with our games, because they are such broadly different styles, they also have uh, each society gravitates to a different communications platform. We use Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, Discord, Steam, forums, live streams, and what we find is that the Trove players like Twitter and the live streams. That's where they go to communicate. With Archage and Rift being more traditional MMOs, they go to the forums because they have to write 14,000 word manifestos as feedback. And believe me, those are brilliant. I really 
really, really brilliant. A uh, short reminder to the players, another reason we need to pay attention is because we're working on the games. We do not have the time to play them to the same extent. It's like in a careers panel later today, we're going to tell you, if you're working in gaming, you're not going to have time to game. And so subject matter expertise is handed over to the players because they play it to a level and a depth that we cannot do. So it's, it's critical to listen to people. Um, we also uh, communicate by email. I'm happy to give out my email address to anybody. It's lcarlson at trialworlds.com. Have at it. Uh, we, uh, for, for some of the, the best people who provide feedback from our communities, we allow them to join our Skype chat so that they can be in direct contact because they're often the first persons to alert us to issues that are going on in game. And let me just give you an example. I was scrolling through my phone earlier. I wasn't because I was being rude. I wanted to look at an example from this morning where it says, Nathaniel Jacob Phillips, I realize that this is probably going to be ignored, but I feel like I need to vent anyways. And he carries on. Oh, no, no, ma chère. This is not ignored. And as a matter of fact, as I was driving over here this morning for this panel, I responded to him. Because we don't ignore it. But there is still that perception out there that if you cannot do exactly what a player wants, that they're being ignored. Often there are very valid reasons, either of game design or technical limitations, and we do our best to bring the players into those conversations and to explain what's going on. Because every time you respond to one player, there are hundreds of others who are also reading that response. And so communication is key to everything. So yeah, I'm going to be responding to all these people who think they're going to be ignored. That's right. You just gave out your email. So there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm going to go off track from my question because I had an interesting, you just brought up an interesting point, which is um, one, one of the big, big problems, uh, it's great to use the word plaguing the game industry, is the, the toxic level of communities that have grown up. Um, a, lot, a lot of them around, it started at MMOs, right? We all experienced it. Uh, and then it's moved into competitive gaming and it's become almost even more toxic. Um, and what's interesting, it, it's, a, it's a rule of thumb we always had uh, from the journalism side at, at MMO was, if you don't like a game, or you don't like something about a game, don't just scream at it. Provide examples, provide a reason, provide a feedback. So I'm very curious, we'll, we'll go back to uh, Amanda, I'm very curious of an example in either Lord of the Rings or Dungeons and Dragons where, no, that's not a problem, that's not a problem, oh my god, that's really a problem, and, and the players actually had influence on, on a, you know, a solid aspect of the game that they, they truly did change, but, but in a positive, feedback way, sure. not in a toxic way. Sure. Um, so this one actually is from a long, long time ago. There was a system design. Systems are some of the, the things we really like community feedback on because you get sort of the wisdom of the crowd. Uh, we had a design where it was a crafting system, and the designer had laid out sort of what the progression was for how long they thought the player should be spending on it and how many resources it would take. And there was a very tiny math error in their design that wasn't readily apparent on paper. But for the end users going through it, it became readily apparent when you're the one having to go and collect all of these widgets and trying to reform those. And so as they went through, uh, the players got to come and like, wow, this seems way longer time than any normal human would ever want to spend doing this, so they sent feedback in. And at first, the, there was some pushback from the designers, like, no, no, it's fine, it's fine. So the players actually got together and worked everything out in a different format to sort of demonstrate, look, this is how this plays out for us. And right in their diagram was, oh, there's the problem right there, it's right here in this middle section. And they were able to go back and tweak that crafting design so that it took that, it was sort of, it was meant to be a gradual curve, and instead it was golf clubbing way up. But you wouldn't feel the pain of that unless you were actually doing the motions of physically doing the combines. All right, so Linda, my, what's your example? <laughs> from Ever Oh my god, that was great. I, I will say, ever, I owe everything to EverQuest. My marriage, my best friends, my career, everything I owe to EverQuest. And also, thank you for giving female dwarves proper beards in that game. I have to, that's my usual feedback in most games, right? Is, where's my freaking beard? The chin's cool. <laughs> but, um, I'll start with the bad example first. Now this was, I did not work for Sony Online at the time that this happened, but there was an in infamous incident called the NGE in Star Wars Galaxies. 
where, uh, and you might, you probably have a lot more background than this, but I was an avid player of Star Wars Galaxies at the time. I had an enormous guild, we had a huge city on the roughest planet, and, uh, and, they just, and the powers that be decided to make a change to make the game more appealing to a broader audience. Unfortunately, this neglected to uh, account for the fact that they would lose more than half of their current audience and not gain the new audience that was expected. And that decision uh, haunts me to this day. I had joined Sony Online Entertainment at the time that we had to announce the shutdown of Star Wars Galaxies. And even at that time, there was such a core group of dedicated, wonderful players that I, I think could have been served better. And it broke my heart when that game closed. Uh, an example of something that was done right, and I'm going to give thanks to PAX for this. Last year at PAX, I had three panels. Uh, one was at PAX South, and then PAX East, and then PAX West, which was called Free to Play versus Play to Win. And it was audience participation. We pulled a, a guild master out of the audience at every show and put them on the panel along with people. Yeah, we had random Kevin and other people. And uh, it, it was great because what we found out is that people were starting to gravitate back to the pay-to-play model. We don't want to be nickel and dimed. We don't want to be bothered with pop-ups asking us to spend money. We don't want a whole bunch of convenience items all over the place. We just want to go back to enjoying the game and paying a monthly fee. That was a bit of a surprise to me that this was the overwhelming response and I wasn't sure if it was just the sorts of people who come to a panel at PAX or perhaps were invested in the games, but we were already looking at this concept um, with regard to Rift, because again, as I mentioned earlier, it was a pay-to-play model, monthly subscription. It then went free-to-play, and we did lose some players from that because the experience had changed. It's a markedly different experience being in a free-to-play game. Even though in Rift, without paying one cent, you can get to max level, you can play any class you want, you can uh, get the best in slot equipment, all of those things, but it was still a different experience. So this year we pioneered the Rift Prime service, which is monthly subscription, and you cannot play without that subscription. And, uh, and surprisingly enough, uh, the zone events that we're having were bigger than any zone events that ever happened when Rift initially launched. So it turns out that it's true. If you listen to your players and you find out what they're looking for and you implement it, they will come. And we're very happy with the way that's going on. Uh, not that they're not complaining about other things on Rift Prime right at the moment, but, but again, that feedback is so important. And because all of us play the games while we're at work whenever we can, we get to hear it firsthand in-game. And that's the best place to get feedback. Those are really good examples. I, I won't go on to the NGE concept, but it, it was heartbreaking, and it, and it was a decision that was made. We were all around for it. Uh, I, I know, I know the guys there. That just had lunch with them at PAX West, and it, it was a tough call. But it was a call that, like you said, lesson learned, right? And that's that's the key. Um, I think I think games, and just to talk about the you know the economies in games and the way you guys spend your money in games. I, I can remember going to GDC Austin. Uh, in GDC Online at the time, right. and we were like free to play. You would have thought it, right? And and somehow the model started to work. And then the model became abused. I think you saw the biggest abuse of a of a kind of free to play, pay to play, loot box model recently. And you saw the community rise up and just absolutely squash uh, the concept of it. And I'm, I'm sure everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> okay. Um, but I, I think I think that's the point is that you want to play a good game. Everyone's willing to pay a fair price. It's when you overtax your players and believe that they're going to, you know, they're going to invest their time. But when they start to invest more money than you realize, I think you're cheating your players. And I think that's a very hard thing to do. Uh, me, I'll buy if I see a cosmetic item that I like. Done. I mean, I even think about it. Right. I want a cool skull helmet for my orc. Done. Linda wants a new dwarven helmet for her dwarf. Done. And then we fight about it. But, uh, but that's the type of stuff that you want to offer your players, right? Um, so, so going into, uh, we're going to get to fan questions, actually, because we're getting there. Um, yeah, do we want to do that? Yeah. All right. Do you guys want to ask some questions? I can ask questions, but my questions are not nearly as good as yours. So <laughs> why don't we uh, step up to the mic, and you guys can ask the panel anything you want. It's PAX. It's your show. So 
as we talk about integrating with community, yeah, now's the time to do it. So absolutely, come on up. So uh, I want to ask about there's this problem where we have well not a, not we have it's a it's a product a game and we have a fragmented community like lots of communities over this one product and I was wondering if there's a way that we could you know try to concentrate all of the communities despite that they're very far different across each other like it, even though it's talking about the same product but they have so many different variations in the communities that we have a problem trying to aggregate them all together. Like, oh yeah, that, that's a really tough problem because there are so many different communication platforms and everyone has a preference. So if you like getting all of your information on Facebook, uh, like, like the players of uh, Defiance do, then it's very difficult to force you to migrate to a platform that you don't like. So with our, our community managers have to be extremely adept at carrying the same message with a different communication style to all of the different channels. And we just constantly cycle through all of them because you cannot make players move. Um, and over, over time, people will figure out where most of the discussion is going on, but we try to hit all of the channels. What about you guys? So for us, sometimes we can do, uh, I believe, behavioral economists refer to this as nudging, uh, where you can sort of incentivize behavior of, yes, we're going to be in these different channels, but players will quickly pick up on if you're doing a behavior in one channel that you're not doing in another one. And so if you're like, huh, that's strange, they only do giveaways in the live stream, players will notice that really quickly. And so if you decide, you know what, I really prefer for our players to communicate with us on Twitter, you start focusing efforts there to see if you can draw them. But like I say, it's really difficult to force the players to sort of all pool in one place. Each of those platforms has a different manner of communication, and that's why everybody's sort of branching among them. Like for the person who doesn't want to do a lot of reading and they're far more visual, they're probably going to be more attracted to something like the live streams or for somebody who's sort of reading on the go, they're probably going to be into a channel that has very concise, quick information that they can plow through really quickly. Uh, so you have to decide the good balance between the method that you can get the message out to the player, ways that you can encourage them to concentrate in a place, but also understand you'll never actually force them to be in one place at one time. Thank you. Well, just to add to that, there's, a, there's an interesting theory out there about the future of communication. Because everything is becoming so global. I did, my friend is doing his PhD. I'm not a PhD at all, uh, but he is. And this is something he told me, which I think applies to everything we talk about here. So he said, there, there is a theory out there um, called either you're in or you're out, right? Don't think of it in terms of division. Think of it in terms of inclusion. And the example they use is uh, sports. Right, so for example, if you're a Seattle Seahawks fan and I'm a Boston Patriots fan, we can still talk football, right? Uh, and you see that now growing in the esports community. You see it growing globally with like the soccer community, where you know I'm a huge fan of Liverpool, um, but they play thousands of miles from me, right? But because I'm a fan, because I, I like soccer, I can talk to anybody who is a soccer fan. And you, and you suddenly, I mean, I've met, I live in New Jersey. It's, pretty multicultural. So I talk to guys from Latin America, Africa, you know, Australia, everything. And it's the, you light up. So so I think for your fragmented communities, stick to your core message of what your game makes it great. Because I think that's that's that topic, right? That's that's the football topic or that's the soccer topic. They're always going to talk about that. And that's where their passion is forget about language barriers. We're all going to have battle fish anyway in a couple of years, right? So um, I think I think that's what makes it simple is keep that core message. Can I okay. ask something really quick? Yeah, go ahead. So we've been talking about how do we message the community, um, but one of the things we're doing in Pantheon that I'm really excited about is once you get the community into the game, how do you get them to uh, find each other, make new friends? Um, you know, like you were talking about you know pe people that like soccer. So one of the things we're doing in Pantheon is, is actually a matchmaking service where it's, it's voluntary, but um, the players, you can put in you know, what time you play, what your play style is, but you can also put in what your hobbies are, what sports teams you like, and the game will match people up and, and bring people together. But that's how important the community is for us 
after the games launch, it launches, and uh, that's the foundation and uh, kind of a way to make friends. We're making a game that's all based you know, around grouping and having fun as a team, so we figured we'd better be pretty proactive and uh, help help people come together. You've been so patient, go ahead. <laughs> All right, um, my question is, how do you deal with and handle and communicate um, with a community that has gone angry based off of something, whether it's a bug or something the developer did incorrect by their view? Well, that, that's pretty easy, actually. You communicate openly and honestly, and you do a mea culpa. If, if you've screwed up, own it. And, and we've done that many times. Our CEO, Scott Hartsman, is very good at it. He'll, go right out and say, we made a mistake, we're sorry about that, we're in the process of fixing it, here's our timeline. And, I, and, and of course, sometimes changes are made for, for design, design reasons or even business reasons because if your game is not making money, it's not going to turn 19 like EverQuest just did, it's just going to fold along the way. Uh, but open, honest and direct communication across as many channels as possible. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, you, you, you get people that get really, they're so passionate about the game and they're, you know, they're posting this thing, I'm going to rage quit if you don't fix this or whatever, but um, seriously, what we found out, it, it, like Linda's saying, is if you're open and you're honest and you listen, and, you, and if, even if you disagree with their point, if you explain, you take the time to explain, well, Here's why we're doing this. Here's why you know, I, you know, we can agree to disagree. Um, it doesn't mean they won't be angry next week about something else, but they usually stick around and keep playing your game. Yeah. You know, so that's that's how we handle the yeah. Full disclosure, that's Leah. Hi, Leah. She's an engineer on Star Trek Timelines. Uh, but she's an avid player of games as well, and every once in a while being an engineer. And opinionated? Uh, yes. <laughs> she knows we make mistakes all the time, and so we made a mistake uh, two days ago. We had a hot Star Trek holiday. Uh, it was first contact day on Thursday. It's fantastic. We were very excited. And we were already giving people things. They were in a good mood and they were happy. You don't get a whole lot of Star Trek holidays. And our uh, PvP server failed silently in the middle of the night. And some number, we're not quite sure how many actually, uh, people didn't get all of their rewards when they logged in the next day. They were all excited on this holiday. And so what did we do? We flat out told everybody, we're sorry. A server failed silently in the middle of the night, and we don't know how many people get rewards, so here's the thing. We're going to give everybody the top reward right now, and it's, it's an incremental thing, so it didn't blow anything out, but it's like, all of you now have access to this ship that maybe you didn't before, because we're sorry, because you might have possibly been impacted. Everyone else was able to come back in a pretty good mood. I promise there will be something else on Tuesday. Um, but we've tried to be quiet before and silently fix something and only say it to the people we thought were impacted. And that is just never worth the subsequent headaches. Your players don't get happier and they will always talk. And we love that, that they're talking to each other about what's happening. And it goes the other way too. If we do have to do something individually for a person, they go tell their friends, no, the, the developers listened. They said they were sorry, they made amends, and I feel good about that now. So we've learned that it's better to just admit it, compensate appropriately, and then say what we're gonna do to make it not happen again. So we then spent the next two days fixing that and it can't fail like that anymore. And then uh, one part that sort of gets overlooked in the, how do you communicate with players when they're all angry? Step one do a lot of listening first. So players, like you don't want to jump right on the first response and start immediately interacting. I actually wait to see several responses first. Sometimes players will talk amongst each other and then form extra questions. And it's better to go through and make sure that if I'm going to have a response that I'm actually addressing all the concerns that people had about it. And then I'll sort of work through the flow of, okay, these seem to be the major concerns people had. Are we covering those? 
Oh, we missed a couple. All right, let me go back and check, see what we can do about that one. Okay, there's still one more outstanding one. Let me see what I can do about that one. Uh, can't do anything about that one. Okay, let me explain what was the blocker for keeping me from addressing this one, but we found a comment. So you sort of work through the flow of it instead of just jumping right on the first response. If you just jump on the first response and go, well, I answered somebody, bye, that's not gonna work. <laughs> I think, I think it's an interesting question that applies to almost every aspect of things. Uh, a bunch of years ago, a good friend of mine, I know this person was a good friend of mine, Valerie Briscoe, who was the manager at CCP, said, we had a huge problem, we addressed it, we admitted it, and you moved on. I think, I think, I think you create more problems when you try to deceive or hide, or I think that applies to everything, right, in, in our world today. Uh, and the, you know, you look at some of the problems that Facebook's going through, and it's like, just be honest. You know, it got screwed up, or whatever screwed up. We're going to fix it, and that's it. And I, th I think people respond nowadays to honesty and to forthright approach to things way better than any kind of weird, <laughs> you know, thought control. Nobody wants that. We can all think for ourselves, especially we're gamers. We that's our whole game, right? Um, but I agree with everybody up here. I think just admit it, move on. We're all human. Mistakes happen, and uh, and then you build. But you do build a better game in the process. Uh, that's that's part of it. That's part of working with the community. So, yeah. yeah good. Thanks. All right. Super patient. You still got your gloves on. It's not that cold, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's kind of cold. So, I feel a, a major disadvantage to the free-to-play model is that, uh, as a person who plays some of those games, I start to feel really dependent on the. I guess particularly with games that have like energy where you can only do so much in, in a particular amount of time, start feeling obligated, like, okay, well, because I have this energy, now I have to go and spend the energy, and, and every single day I have to make sure that I'm checking in with the game because I don't want to feel like I'm missing out on some opportunity. And over time, I start to feel resentful about that. As in, like, maybe I don't want to ever do a free to play game ever again. I'm going to finish up the one I'm doing, and then just run, ever. Um, uh, and I don't really understand why there are conflicts in the sense like this is actually exactly what you're doing with having so much in this models in a single game where you have a free to play option because I understand some people have less money than others. Uh, I have less time and I really don't want to feel obligated to spend that time, especially on a daily basis, to whatever it is that I'm playing. So, uh, challenges or opportunities in, in having both the monthly model and the free model. Um, are you doing both sometimes? Well, we're d the Rift Prime service is a, a new experiment for us, and it's working very, very well. Um, I feel your pain, though. Uh, but also, if I'm subscribing to a game, like I subscribe to World of Warcraft as well, they have never varied from that model, and I still feel like. I've spent $15, I need to go get $15 worth of, of fun out of the game. You know, not on a daily basis, no, definitely not. Uh, because when I look at fun, I'm like, okay, so if I go to Starbucks, that's going to be five bucks for a, a nice latte, right? So $15 is almost nothing. That's like a ticket to a 3D showing of a movie. Where I find I feel very pressured is in mobile games. So I'm going to send this down to the other end of the table because I have to log into Summoners War and Heyday every day and Best Fiends or I lose my mind because I'm not getting my stuff for logging in. And I also run the neighborhood in Heyday for a bunch of friends, so I feel guilty if I don't log in and, and help them out. So, so how do you handle that in mobile games? Because I think that's where the pressure is biggest. Enjoy! <laughs> One of the biggest things as developers, especially designers, is developing that actual empathy for the player. Yeah. And understanding that people play very differently. And a lot of games, especially in the mobile space, will try and create a single experience that everyone's going to go through. That is the only thing that is happening. If you want to be a fan of this game, you are going to spend all of your energy, and you are going to craft and build all of these things, and you are going to engage with everyone else in one single manner. We have found that that uh, is not the easiest way to keep people engaged. Instead, we treat it like there's a series of hobbies in a single game. Um, there's not a lot of punishment. 
Uh, for not logging in in the Disruptor Beam games, uh, it's a little more so in the Forex games, um, like March to War. But when we talk about things like our RPGs, we don't just give you the one linear story that you're going to be able to go through and collect all of your characters and do that. Um, there's also the completely optional, nothing is going to prevent you or make you play PvP. Um, from the ships. There's also the direct head-to-head -head competition on your characters. But what we try and do is actually listen to the different play styles that people are telling us that they have. And then we do data science to kind of break down what these different uh, play styles are and how they group around them. And we'll actually develop new features that uh, stop pushing on the things that are already um, tight. So energy, for example. When we create a new system, we say, all right, we already have a thing that pushes on energy. People are already thinking about this. They're paranoid about it. What am I going to do? Make something that doesn't require energy, that's still engaging, that says, I don't have to worry about when that's going to refill, right, and get in there and do it or I lose it. It's like, all right, it's something that I can engage with on my own time limit and come back and check and feel good about that. And, um, this is why it's very strange. In a lot of the Facebook games, you saw a lot of commitment gameplay. Set it on your schedule, come back, you're okay with that. It doesn't go away, that's why Farm will eventually take out rotting. Um, you don't see that as much in mobile games yet. I think you'll start to see it. So as developers realize, people have very different styles. And so you actually have to find feature sets that hit these different styles, but all tie together into this world. Um, our goal is to learn to play as different people play and then expand our games to be able to encompass those. And it's not perfect and it's growing and we'll get there. I, I think it's grown a lot, actually. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think you see the example in MMOs too, where you know you see certain games now, you can log in and go into any zone and level based on that, you know, wherever you are as a character. That didn't exist years ago. You're like, man, I gotta finish this level, and I gotta get up there, and I, get, I can't play with my friends because now they're level 20 and they're in a completely different zone. You don't see those problems anymore, which I think is a huge step uh, in, in that regard. And, and I agree with you, I, but I will say this, and I've said it from the beginning, online games or a gaming experience is still the best entertainment value for your dollar, period, right? We can, I agree, I mean, I used to go to movies for three bucks as a kid, and now I have to pay 16. Right? And I'm only there two hours. Economies build based on play, or you want to buy this, that's great. If not, and I think, I think the other thing too is the horizontal development of games is really exciting as opposed to forcing everybody to level up. Mm -hmm. Right? And you feel left out, or you, you feel like you miss a day, and you're, ugh, I didn't log in today, forget it, I'm going to move on to another game. That, that's not conducive to a positive community. Right? So, go ahead. Sorry. Hi. So, I wanted to tackle. Uh, Communities have changed a lot over the years that MMOs have existed, and you have people who want a lot of different things, and I wanted to ask how you guys handle when two different sectors of your community want conflicting things. For example, one of the things we talked about on Thursday was you have people who want to be able to in, have someone on 24 hours a day and be there in five minutes anytime a really good mob pops and you kill it, and then you have people who get really upset about that because, oh, well, this one guild kills everything. There's no chance for anyone else to do it. How do you deal with that kind of conflict where both sides aren't necessarily doing anything wrong, but they want different things? Well, I'd love to hear how Pantheon's going to handle that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we actually do. I mean, there's, there are different ways to deal with that. With, with Pantheon, the you know, you, you have the core game, and uh, obviously if you don't like the core game, that's okay, it's not a game for everyone. But you're absolutely right that quite often you'll have people who are fans of the core game, but there's these other kind of nuanced issues um, where they disagree. And um, the classic one, of course, is PvPers versus PvE, right? right? And uh, so our answer is, is alternate rule set servers where we have different shards that are still have the, the game is still Pantheon, but you have your role playing, you have your PvP, you've got your you know, conquest. 
all different types of alternate rule sets. We'll be launching with some uh, part, you know, as we expand after launch, uh, we'll, we'll have more variations on the theme. But I think that's what it is. You, you make a great game, and then you, uh, especially if you're using like the shard server-based model, um, you can then tailor make your game uh, that experience to those different types of players. And for us, that's that's the answer. It worked really well with that request, I think, and we're going to take it to the next step. And, uh, on our end, what we find helps a lot is being up front with the player about what the experience is going to be before they get there. So if you take a game like DDO, where when the game came out, it was it was what it was. You had people that were having trouble because it was too hard for them, and then at the same time, you had people like, oh, this is easy, this is a cakewalk. And so, all right, well, how do we make something that amps both? So obviously, we had difficulty levels, but the most important factor wasn't the fact that it was a scaling difficulty, it was the fact that it told the player what the experience was gonna be before it happened. Shooters have been doing this for a long time. You choose easy mode or you choose nightmare mode. So if you die in nightmare mode, you know that, oh, this was nightmare mode, that's gonna be too hard for me, and you're deciding what kind of experience you're going to have going in. There's a lot of times where a game will sort of present itself, but if there's no expectation bar set for the end user, when they come in to play, and then let's say it's too hard, or it's too easy, or there's too many, you know, cycle, whatever that experience is, if they don't have a framework for it, it's not going to meet their expectation, and they're not going to have fun. So for me, one of the issues that I've come across is the fact that when, when you have a game, we all know that the players are kind of your bosses, but it's like, can you imagine working for 50,000 mini-bosses? Because they all want something different, and you're being called on the carpet in their office on whatever communication channel you're on. Me? I am a filthy, hardcore, casual, role-playing alcoholic. I will make as many characters as you give me slots for, and I will go out and role play them, and I don't level fast, and I love to explore, and I love to craft, and I love to communicate with people and build guilds. Other people are very hardcore. So when I go to some place and I post on the forums, oh man, our group's having a really tough time taking down this encounter, anybody got advice? Learn to play, bro. You know, it's like, I can do this with one arm tied behind my back while totally blind drunk, you know, going uphill in the wintertime. And it's like, yeah. All right, so I, I have seen that one of the reasons there's so many good games on the market now, and they're all surviving, they may not be huge, but they have found a market that they understand where they cater to a smaller subset of, of player types. Because keeping everybody happy is absolutely impossible. As anyone who's ever had more than one child can attest, it's just not going to work. Uh, but what Amanda said is very valid too. Set expectations so that people know. People know that Rift, for instance, is primarily a PvE game. People know that Arc Age is really, after level 35, primarily PvP. So, but um, accommodating all the different play styles is, is the, probably the biggest challenge before us. And Brad's solution is one that's, that's widely used in the game industry. Yeah. Cool. I think we are just about out of time. So did you guys want to close with a quick final thought? And then we'll go right down the list. Final thought. <laughs> So many thoughts. Um, for me, the biggest part is that uh, I used to do this exercise a lot with new developers, which would be to train them how to interface with the community. I would be giving the presentation, and while I was going through the intro, I would be handing out some chocolates just as a snack. And I did this with you know seven or eight different groups. But the response is always the same. Eventually, after eating the chocolate for a little bit, one person will speak up and say, "Man, what's wrong with this chocolate?" Now, they don't know, but I've actually taken just unsweetened baking chocolate and handed it to them. But, so they're eating it. And so whoever speaks up, I'm like, oh, what do you mean? They're like, yeah, there's something wrong with this chocolate. I was like, oh, did you go to culinary school? And they're like, no. I'm like, well, then why do I care what you think? And they stopped, and my favorite response was a developer got really red-faced, and he goes, because I'm the one who has to eat it. And I'm like, yes. And then all of a sudden he stopped, he's like, wait. Wait, is this like about the presentation? <laughs> yes! Your players are the ones who have to play it. They may not have all the technical development. 
you know, terminology to know, but they know when they don't like something. And it will take them time to learn how to articulate that to you, but they know when they don't like something, and that's important to keep in mind. Okay. Here we go. We're, we're really yeah, out of time. Absolutely. Here we go quick. Right. Do me a favor. Judges have conversations where you're trying to get in touch with the developer to talk about something that's not working. Please talk to each other about it. Understand why you like it, why you don't like it, what it is you would like to see change, because we are we are slightly watching those conversations. We are getting down to the root of it. And then when you come and do get in, you do get through to the developers, it's a well thought out idea. And we want to hear all the different perspectives on it so that we can get in there as fast as we can and find solutions for you or hear your awesome solutions you came up with by collaborating. So don't just don't just yell at us. We're gonna listen anyway, but remember, have a conversation with each other too. So, so we've talked about messaging to the community, we've talked about getting feedback back from the community. Um, there's something uh, I think kind of special with Pantheon too that we're, we're gonna really we're going to have to rely on the community. And that is when, when we first launch, you know, we have, we have different audiences. What, the old school audience who understands our game, understands what makes it work, why it's fun. Um, we're going to be counting on you guys to uh, help onboard uh, younger players who never played a group-based, challenging, uh, you know, uh, shared memory retention-based game. Um, you know, a lot they they if they played MMOs, it's just been you know the hyper casual ones, or maybe they've never played an MMO. So um, we we kind of look at, at the community, the core community that's building now, uh, like that we're on the same team, that we're working together on this. And we're going to really need your help with it. So thank you in advance. <laughs> okay, final thought. We are always listening. If there is a game company that is not listening, they're not going to last long. So we're as invested as you are in making the best games possible. And uh, although there's, you know, like one developer to every 40,000 players out there, uh, the communication that we have with you is so important and never be afraid to reach out. Leave behind the abusive language, leave behind the personal insults, leave behind telling companies to fire individuals that work for them. We want your information and we want to form a partnership with you, all our little mini bosses. Awesome, guys, thanks so much for staying out. It's so great everything tomorrow. I feel like everything's smarter. That's the key, right? That's it, guys. Have a great pack. Go down on the show floor and, and play all the games, see everything, talk to these guys. It'll, it'll be great.